Okay, so. Now I'm unmuted, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when Sorry, there's several I'm, trying, I'm trying to mute myself. <laughs> so, okay. Oh, I don't want that. Turn that off. There you go. All right. So, good morning. Technical, <laughs> technical fun with with working in in uh, three different areas of Tallahassee. <laughs> So, um, so I'm uh, Dolly Frank, and I am the Florida Electronic Library Administrator, but I am also um, a stand-in person for the uh, statistics, the state data coordinator, the library statistics program. And I'm here to uh, talk about, am I, oops, what's going on? There we go. Strange. Uh, I'm here to talk about the uh, upcoming annual statistical report and some supplemental uh, questions that we're going to be asking. Can Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, and good morning. I'm Claudia Holland, Chief of the Bureau of Library Development, and uh, Dolly's sidekick. Um, and when she says she's a stand-in for the, uh, uh, the state data coordinator, she's not just a stand-in, she's doing a, a fabulous job and, and we really appreciate all of her hard work in this area. One thing I do want to mention, Claudia, it's about a three second lag from the time I click on something to when it shows up on screen. Um, we're just having some uh, slowdowns in the networks, I think. So we're here um, to talk about the Florida Annual Statistical Report and answer your questions. We had a webinar at the beginning of July, and um, if you have had a chance to watch that webinar, we, we talked a lot about what is coming up on the Florida Annual Statistical Report. Uh, so this one is going to have a little bit in the way of a very short review have a lot of time to ask and answer questions and talk a little bit about uh, some of the um, additional items that you'll be seeing uh, on a supplemental uh, report that we're going to be having in counting opinions that will be open at the same time as the annual statistical report. So on the annual statistical report that we're going to have open in the state aid application, um, as a reminder, the programs that we ask for are the planned events that are attended for groups. Um, and what we're doing this year is we're making sure that everyone understands that this encounters, this includes both in-person and virtual programs that are held in real time. So I'm, I'm sure that everyone may be familiar with the term live streaming, but just in case, uh, here's a reminder. Um, actually, it's uh, real time, as, as Dolly said, and that includes the ability for, for you to interact with um, presenters and vice versa. So it's something that is just in a different format um, not face-to-face, -face, but virtual. And I'm sure we're all used to having doing that, uh, especially over the past five months. And I've just thrown uh, some examples up. This is not even close to being all of the examples, but in a lot of cases, if you can do it in person, you can do it virtually with a live stream. So that's a very, very, very brief overview of what we talked about in the webinar and I'm going to open it up to any questions that um, folks might have and Casey said that if you want to talk she'll um, unmute you if you raise your hands or you can always throw questions into the chat any questions <laughs>
Okay, now, so for the update for the annual statistical report, now this is for the, the report that is in counting opinions that is part of the state aid application that's going to be due in December. Uh, a couple of updates. Um, a lot of folks are concerned because there's so many differences this year and so many changes from what might have been reported last year. And as folks, old timers who have known counting opinions for a very long time, there's something that is in the system that's called an edit check that says, if you have changed significantly from last year, you have to tell us why. Well, we're removing most of those edit checks because we pretty much know why. And we don't wanna have to uh, force you to put in a note for every single time. Last year you had 10,000 of something and this year you have 10. Um, Unless it's something that is very different that we may not have as part of our normal understanding of what's going on this year, um, we're not we're not asking you to put in. It was COVID, we were closed. It was COVID, we were closed. It was COVID, we were closed for every single thing. The other thing that we're doing this year is we're putting in the ability to use counted, not counted, or not applicable um, for a lot more of our questions. Um, so as a reminder, um, zero is a value, and it means that you counted what was going on and there weren't any. There weren't any circulations, or there weren't any visits, or there weren't any reference questions. You had them, you, you, you offered them, but um, nobody took advantage of it. Um, not counted means that there were numbers, but you didn't count them. Uh, reference questions happened, items circulated. Um, you, you just aren't sure what they were. You can't report the exact figure. And then not applicable means that, that the services may not have been held. Um, it just isn't something that your library does. And so um, you, you can go ahead and we'll have that as an, as an option. And that'll be new for this year. Hey, Dolly, we do have a hand raise. Okay. Um, yes, please. Lois, I have unmuted you, but you are self-muted, so feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, here we go. Um, my question is, um, with all of these virtual programs that we're doing, children's programs, teen programs, and so on, um, are they still going to have... Um, accounts necessary in terms of uh, particular age groups because that's kind of hard to do when it's a virtual program we can't see our audience in terms of you know how many toddlers or how many you know preschoolers or school age children so that was just something that my um, children's librarian asked me to to ask of you sure what a super good question um, so count the number of attendees or the viewers that's based on the age target of the program. So if you've mm -hmm. got a story time and you've got 50 people viewing, it doesn't matter if the 50 people are all the grandparents of the toddlers mm -hmm. you can as, as being toddlers because that's the age target audience for that program. That's so what that's we assumed of, since there was no other way to do it, but I just wanted to double check with you. Absolutely. All right, thank that's you. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide because it seems appropriate for right now. Any other questions that we can talk about? Now this is for this particular section is about the annual statistical report as it is in counting opinions that is part of the state aid application. So the the, the programming questions on there are going to be for the real time programs that you offer, either in person or virtual, and it's going to be a lump one lump, they'll be combined together, so the, the whole total will be in one place. Any questions before I move on to the next little bit? And again, we went 
into a lot of detail uh, with this in our original webinar, which is on the YouTube page. And um, the link to that should have been in the uh, announcement that I send out about this one. If you haven't had a chance and you can't find that link, um, let me know and I can send it to you. Um, Casey might even be able to throw it into the chat. Okay, not seeing any hands raised. I'm going to move on. So now we're going to talk about a supplemental survey that we're having this year. Again, this is going to be in counting opinions and it's going to be voluntary. This is for folks who are interested in filling out this information, folks that are interested in sharing more detailed information than we have on the um, state aid application statistical report uh, again and i'm going to emphasize this this is this is for this year this is voluntary the reason that we're having a supplemental survey and not actually having it inside the state aid application annual statistical report is because uh, the state aid annual statistical report that is part of the state aid application is in rule and it takes a, a while, it takes a, a several months at the very least to go through a rule revision and have things updated. And we just don't have the time to get that done between now and when we open this up. We're hoping to open it up in October, state aid application opening in October. And this statistical supplemental statistical survey will um, also be open early October, maybe October 1st. Um, and so, this, the questions that are going to be on here, we plan to incorporate into the, the survey, the annual statistical report. We just have not um, been able to get the, the rule change started and everything going. So that's the reason why it's supplemental this year and not actually part of the um, survey. So on the, on the supplemental survey, we're going to go into more in-depth programming questions. We're going to be breaking it down more and getting more from you than um, a lump sum of the real-time programming events that you've done. We're, there are also some COVID questions that are specifically related to COVID-19 and we have a couple of uh, economic impact questions as well. And Dolly, if I could just add into this, that um, in talking about the rule process and so on, the um, programming questions will be added permanently to the uh, uh, annual statistical report. The COVID questions, on the other hand, uh, will be added temporarily, um, but we may rework those questions to encompass other types of disasters or other situations that involve closures uh, for libraries. So um, that will be sort of changed, tweaked perhaps a little bit. Hopefully COVID will, will you know, fade away at some point, uh, we hope. Um, <laughs> we do like the idea of having other questions that address things like hurricanes or other, uh, you know, maybe someone's doing uh, having some construction done to their library or whatever that, that uh, involves temporary closure. Um, and also the uh, economic impact questions will be added permanently um, for each reporting year because uh, we want to um, have more uh, data to, to address how libraries are impacting uh, the economy of Florida uh, and what uh, expenditures are being made in Florida for things like um, purchasing materials or um, databases, et cetera. So um, we'll be uh, happy to answer any questions you might have about any of those um, three areas in this survey. Okay, so very, very briefly, quickly, um, the questions that are going to be on the supplemental survey that have to do with programming are going to break out the in-person and the virtual so that we have account for the folks that are in the library and the and 
other library sponsored locations and the count of the visits that you have that are virtual. And we're also adding this year self-directed programming. So the, the difference between active and self-directed is active involves library staff being interactive with people, um, leading story times, answering um, questions about how to, or showing people how to do crafts, um, Whereas self-directed are the sorts of things like, uh, for example, self-directed virtual programs could be recordings that are on your YouTube site that people just go to whenever they want to and click on. So we won't be counting self-directed in this year's annual statistical report that is going to be part of the state aid application. That is correct. But we are hoping that you're counting them and that you can share on the supplemental survey what those self-directed um, programming statistics are and and gary it's very true that this year it won't be on the report but next year we're going to be adding it to the report so that as you're starting your new fiscal year in october um, keep in mind that we're going to be asking you for self-directed programming statistics um, so if you if you can start to count those when you start your new year even if you're not counting them now um, we'll be asking that and of course again there's going to be the not counted or the not applicable or the you know zero question you know um, options for that um, but if if you're doing a lot It depends. Okay, so the, the so the question is, what metric are we using to count self-directed? And there are so many metrics to be used. What we're looking for is the usage of your self-directed programs. So if you've got a video, then yes, I would say views would be it. And one view equals one person who's using your um, recording. However, there's lots of types of self-directed programs. Um, uh, downloads of worksheets or what what have you would be another one so there's so I think each self-directed program as you put it into place you may have to just take a look at it and say what is the easiest way to count this if it's a coloring sheet do we count the number of coloring sheets does that make sense so so self-directed it's 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 really up to you and I would highly recommend whatever is easy and convenient and doable so that you're not overwhelmed but that you get a picture you get a sense of of how what's being used how they're being used and it, it gives you a chance to talk about other ways that the library is interacting with your community and and providing resources and are you know sharing information and, and just being a huge impact on the community uh, I, I just want to reiterate here too <clears throat> that it's important to whatever uh, system you set up to be consistent. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're consistent, um, then that that makes it easier and uh, to compare year to year data. Um, so just as you are thinking about collecting uh, data that you haven't perhaps collected before be sure to to have a conversation uh with those you know you work with to ensure that that you're going to all be consistent in how you're collecting that information and i see that megan has a question the view for video should be at least one minute long to count correct so the short answer to that is yes uh, the slightly longer answer is that not every single platform provides a differentiation between like a one second to three second and a one minute so if you have the ability to count a, a minute or longer then yes um, unless of course your video is shorter than a minute at which point you'll have to count something less than a minute um, if it's a real quick little snippet but um, the, the difference between uh, so, some of the analytics that the, the folks use out there, the different platforms use out there, is they'll take a look at um, things that are shorter than three seconds and they'll, they'll put them in a type of analytic. And that really is 
maybe as somebody's scrolling along their Facebook feed, a video pops open and they just keep scrolling. And I would not recommend counting those just because they really haven't looked at your video. It just, they probably closed it or, or scrolled even quicker because it popped open because they were looking for something different. Um, but yes, if, if you have the chance to count for a minute, the, the views that are a minute or longer, then those would be definitely views. And again, we're looking at usage. You can count all sorts of things yourself. Um, what we're looking for is something to put into the annual statistical report. Um, and again, here's the other thing is that in this supplemental survey, we are testing the waters, right? To see how this works. Um, you'll be seeing definitions we can share, you know, those, it'll open up in October. You can see what the definitions are. Um, you'll have a chance to give me feedback. You can have some ideas on better things to count, maybe. Um, and of course, you can use whatever you want for your own counting as well. But but we're looking for some way to have, be able to count how many users have accessed self-directed information programming um, at your library. So this will give you a, a great idea to look at this supplemental, give me feedback before we actually get the rule change in progress and say, hey, we love it, we hate it, we suggest these tweaks. It's kind of a dry run before we change the rule. So I'm gonna jump to the next slide, just a real quick review of different examples of the different types of, of um, self-directed active programs. Again, we went into more depth in the, the um, webinar that we did in July. And I'm gonna, Open the floor up to any more questions, comments. Um, I, I just want to point out, uh, would you go back to that slide for just a minute, Dolly? The, uh, the previous one about green. with the examples. Yeah. So we have had some questions, haven't we, about you know people saying, okay, I'm going to do uh, like the the uh, poetry example that you're providing. Um, and we're counting each one of those as separate programs, correct? Correct, yes. Yes, so if, for example, you've decided to really go out for, I don't know, Poetry Month or Poetry Week, all kinds of different programs, and you're going to have all of the things that are on that board, each one of those is a different program. You can count them separately. So you're counting... Remember, you're not only counting usage, but you're counting programs. And so if you've got, for example, if you've got um, a posted poetry board and one week it is posted poetry for teens and we're going to do vampires, give me the best vampire poem that you can come up with using post-it notes. And then the next week it's um, uh, posted poetry for uh, folks, um, over 50 and say, give us the best, you know, Beatles related stuff from your childhood. Those are two different programs, even if they're both posted poetry boards. And a question specifically, I'm gonna, Amy, can I, can I read this out loud? Okay. So Amy has shared with me, um, if we posted a video on how to use our curbside service, is that a program? or we're planning a video on getting a library card. Is that a program? Oh boy. I think that the curbside service itself is definitely the pro a program, um, although it could also be circulation. Um, if it's instructions on how to use it, I'm not sure I would consider that a program or an, a video on how to get a library card. I'm not sure that I would consider that a program, um, but I think it may be up to you on like what's in the video and 
other things that you might, but remember, you also are asking things about reference questions. And, and maybe what we need to do is start talking about virtual reference questions. I mean, we already do some of that, right? In the, in the statistical report. So is every time somebody clicks on a, how do I get a library card? Yeah, is it a tutorial? That's a good question. Is it a tutorial are you teaching them? So I think it really does depend on the video. And, and then you take a look at it. It depends on what, you, again, curbside is a program. I think it depends on what it is you're doing. Is, curb, is it a curbside pickup of a craft that somebody's taking home and making? Yeah, it's a program. If it's curbside pickup of the videos they're checking out, then it's circulation. So it really depends on what it is that they're picking up. Yeah, I like I, I like Rebecca's uh, point too. Are you teaching them? So yeah, yeah let's say you created yeah. this um, this video or tutorial, and you introduced it in a program. Just you know, maybe going through the services that your library provides or whatever. But after that, then it's an individual who's just sort of clicking on it to to find out how to do it. Um, you may want to count how much that video is being used from a reference or you know point of view but i agree that that would not be considered a program per se we had yeah. this discussion for the flip summer reading statistics as well you know the difference between what's what's a marketing video versus what's what's a program and one thing that you know we told those who do the use services statistics is that if you could or would take this thing and you could do it as an in-person program then it's an in-person program so you know if it's just a commercial so to speak you probably wouldn't be doing that you know live <laughs> in front of a room of people versus you know that's more marketing your services whereas as rebecca mentioned in the chat you know an actual tutorial walking through something doing it digitally but you would also do it in person if you could sort of helped i think some of them differentiate between a marketing video versus a programming video and then the question uh, someone asked is so a pile of coloring sheets is a program the the short answer to that is it would be considered a self-directed program each sheet is not a program that's the usage and you um but yes i mean it's a self-directed in person if it's a pile of coloring sheets that they have to come to the library to pick up yes it is but you have to make the coloring sheets. You have to put them out. Okay, another question is, can you explain the difference between all four of the self-direct and active so I can get a clear understanding of what you have in the examples? Okay. And um, Claudia, you can please jump in here too. Yeah, I just wanna point out too um, uh, that th this information is, um, is already recorded in our uh, previous um, webinar. So you can always refer to that if you get confused or if you don't remember or whatever the situation may be. So um, please refer to that. And uh, I, I don't know, uh, Casey, did you have a chance to find that link? By yeah, she did, okay. she posted it in the chat. So the, 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 the link to the YouTube is in the chat. So okay. very quickly, a self-directed in-person um, is, is one where somebody comes into the library to, but doesn't have to interact with staff to do something. So for example, they can do, um, there's like a local, like a little craft corner where folks can go over and pick up a, a printed out direction on how to do origami. And there's, there's folding, examples and folding directions and there it is and you know the staff person doesn't have doesn't go over and say here let me show you how to do this let's let's or let's do a class in origami it's it's a hey you you want to learn origami here's how to make a swan you just fold on the lines um and that would be self-directed in person because in person means they have to go into the library to pick it up 
or they have to go to a library sponsor location to pick it up. Um, uh, the Post-it po Poetry Board would be just sticking something out and saying, hey, stick a note up, st stick your best Post-it Poetry up, or choose choose one of the words that's on this Post-it and you guys all put, to get, put them together. Um, a self-directed virtual would be something like a tutorial or a, a video or something that they, they link or a challenge that you say, okay, tweet out your best things. It's virtual. It's sort of like the poetry board, but tweet, it, tweet us, here's the challenge, tweet us the Beatle po post or tweet, tweet us the vampire poetry. Um, so both of the active means that you are interacting with the folks. You either are interacting with them in person or you're interacting with them in the chat rooms, in a Zoom, um, in a Skype, uh, in Facebook Live, somehow answering questions, going back and forth, showing them how to do things. Does is that answer your question? Let's see, other questions. So if we left out 500 coloring sheets, how would we count that? One program and 500 people? No, no, if you left out 500 coloring sheets, that's one program. If 500 coloring sheets went away, you would count that as one program and 500 people. If at the end of the day, you've got 200 coloring sheets left, then that would be one program, 300 people. Does that make sense? And then coloring sheets would be under self-directed. And coloring sheets probably would be best self-directed in person because they have to pick them up. Okay, any any other questions before I move on? Um, we actually have, it's a three second lag here. Hold on, we actually have a question mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hand raises, comments, chat, okay. Um, so we're gonna move on. There's Programming is a very large part of the supplemental survey, but we also have uh, a couple of other um, areas of interest on the supplemental survey. Yeah, so the, um, the COVID-19 related questions, these, uh, questions were proposed by the Institute of Marie Museum and Library Services and are going to be collected at the national level. So it's really important that even though this is a voluntary um, exercise, if you will, uh, that you please um, consider filling it out because that way uh, not only are we reporting to the feds, what, what's happening in our state, but we here at, at the division, we are learning more about how COVID affected you and your library. Um, so uh, I, I do hope that you will, you will consider completing that uh, survey. Uh, most of these questions are yes, no. Um, and I don't, there are about 15 to 17 of those questions, so I don't envision that it will take you a lot of time, but again, you, you know, your time is precious, and we understand that. We just hope that you will um, consider uh, completing that survey. Yeah, and as Claudia said, it, they're, they're yes or no. Were you open or were you not open? Were you, did you uh, have electronic services? Did you not have electronic services? Did you use Wi-Fi? Did you not use Wi-Fi? I mean, these are pretty straightforward questions. Um, and then there are two questions about how many weeks, like how many weeks were you closed? How many weeks were you partially open? I, and I think that's it. So they're, they should be brief, um, but it's, it's a real good way for the uh, IMLS to be able to show how libraries were impacted by COVID-19, but also be able to show the services um, that libraries were able to provide nationally and, and be able to continue to um, create the help that your communities need. Um, a couple of other questions that are going to that we're adding to the supplemental 
survey have to do with the economic impact of your library in the state? Um, so this, these are questions that will be permanently added uh, to the uh, uh, annual statistical report after this year. Um, and we anticipate that this information will help us in uh, when we are doing studies on the economic impact of libraries and uh, in our state and also on a return on investment study um, that we are planning to do. So please, um, again, this is a, like a percentage is not an exact figure, uh, but you know, what, uh, uh, what percentage of your um, your uh, budget was expended for in-state services? Yeah, yeah, and and um, and I think there also is not just for let's see libraries. So this is one of this is one of the um, draft uh, explanations. Um, but it's so it's uh, in-state services, materials, or contracts, and then we also ask about I think. Um, utilities uh, and construction, um, that kind of thing. So it's it's basically just uh, an expansion of the normal statistical report questions that have to do with expenditures. So like, how much did you spend? How much was it in state? That's pretty much what it's it's going to look like when we add it to the um, the annual statistical report as a permanent fixture. All right, so that is an overview. Um, I, I, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, and we would, this is a Q&A. We've done a lot of talking. I'd love to hear from you guys, get a chance to answer any questions you might have or thoughts you might have. So one question you had before, Dolly, um, while people are thinking, uh, what had to do with um, resources that were provided potentially by the, uh, a, an MLC or a multi-type library uh, cooperative to a, a member library. And how would you count that, for example? Oh, absolutely. Good, good point. I'd, I'd forgotten I had that question. Um, so I know that there have been some of the multi-type library cooperatives who have purchased um, access to several different types. I think uh, summer reading, some of the summer reading um, databases and some of the uh, overdrive materials and that sort of thing. And this isn't necessarily for programming, but some of it is for programming um, across the way. And even if you as a library were not expending the funds, but a multi-type library cooperative was expending the funds on your behalf, and you can see what your statistics are, please, please, please report them. Because these this is information that is going to go to IMLS. Um, and the multi-type library cooperatives don't report to IMLS. So any money that is spent for you, please report those statistics. Examples of those expenditures. Um, I know that, uh, gosh, what is the name of that? Um, the summer reading program, the um, page turners, was it page turners, I think, that Nephlin bought for their member libraries up in the, the Northeast, Read, Read Square. Square. Yeah. Yeah. So these are so these are some some I mean they're summer reading and you should report them on your summer reading statistics, but you also include the summer reading statistics in your annual statistics. You, they're not two separate things. They're two separate things in that the summer reading is separated out because it's a very specific program or series of programs. Um, but we also want those included and in, and so yes. Um, let's see, are the COVID questions clear in what they want the response to be considering that we are offering different levels of service at different branches? Um, they are not, they are not. I think they're, um, I think there may be, um, 
that's you know what that's a good question because we can do that we can do that at our level and so amy i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna say that's a great suggestion and we may be able to figure out a way to do that separate them out um the imls questions themselves are system-wide so i think the questions are sort of more generic like in your system did any of your branches or did you have any service at all um, there may be some more specific ones at the outlet level um and let me think on that do you think that would be important anyone does does anyone think that system level versus outlet level would be a good differentiation to make okay amy says that um it might be it might be hard to answer the question um if it's so if it's at the system level and you can say to yourself well the whole system didn't do it but we did have like my branch did it so we did provide some services or we did provide x y and z claudia i think that's a conversation we might have yeah i see vicky's so, response yeah. sometimes the only statistics you can get are at system level yeah. Yes, so it, I, I think it depends on how you collect the data at the local level and what uh, what you believe is important. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you know, if, if we would certainly like to hear from libraries who feel like uh, this is an important differentiation that we should be making. Yeah, I mean, so this so the the supplemental survey is at this point extremely. Uh, movable. So if any branch offered something that was or was open, then the answer is yes. In it, yes, at this point in time, if any branch offered something or was open, then the answer is yes. Yeah. The other thing I want to add too is in the in the uh, annual statistical report specifically, uh, any notes that you provide that add uh, depth to your answer or you know some sort of quirky thing or whatever is really appreciated so yeah, we, make those. we actually do feel free to use that that note section to to put in whatever you want to explain yeah. your answer yeah that doesn't mean you have to but yeah. you so having having looked at the annual statistical report and the notes fields that are in there some folks do put in some amazing information that is so helpful in just in the notes field i mean it's a little frustrating because you know you get to the thing and it's a yes or a no or it's how many blah how how many circulations or how many whatevers and all you have the chance to do is put in a number but then somebody will then open up the notes field and say you know we were closed for four weeks because of hurricane michael and then we had this other thing happen and then something else happened and that's why and it's so helpful it is so helpful. Yeah. I was wondering what might be a good example when you talk about contract involving expended for in-state services so I can get a good idea. Okay, so for example, um, I'll, I'll think of um, you have... Um, well, let's say... Here's I'll go back to the MLCs, all right? So let's go back to the MLCs. The multi-type yeah. library cooperative may provide uh, overdrive for their folks. Everybody sort of buys into this overdrive and you send the money to the multi-type library cooperative who then pays the vendor. Because you're spending your money with an in-state uh, group, nonprofit in this case, that would be an in-state vendor that you were purchasing services from. You're, you're purchasing your eBooks from Neflin or PBLC or Swiftlin or whoever. Um, so that would be in-state. Uh, your utilities are probably in-state. Your rent is probably in-state. You've probably got a contractor if, you, if you're putting um, a capital outlay out and you, you've hired a local contractor, that would be an in-state uh, expenditure. Um, 
yeah. let's, let's think about collections for a minute. Let's say you're purchasing collections and you're buying from Amazon, for example, obviously that would be an out of state expenditure. If you're buying locally for whatever reason, and I know people use jobbers like, you know, Baker and Taylor or Yankee or whomever, um, then you know, that that to me would be considered out of state unless that company or corporation or whatever were located in the state. Yeah. Um, and I know, for example, for summer reading, there's a lot of folks who might spend money on um, uh, like the uh, a local puppet theater or a local acting troupe or the local clowns uh, to come in. That would be in state um local 10 companies yeah um but let's say you have a, a lawn service um that would be an in-state expenditure if that's something that you pay for right uh, you know something something that's not necessarily local it can be local but it could also be another service provided in the state yeah hope that helps right queen pick one If we paid for virtual content for virtual performances by local performers, would that count? Yes, it would. It absolutely would. But I think there's a, there's a, there was a summer reading squad that I think, if I recall correctly, was out of Jacksonville that was very popular for a very long time. Um, even if you're in South Florida and you're hiring this group from Jacksonville to come down, that's still in state. So, you've got local microfilmers, maybe local digitization folks. Um, local binderies. Binderies, I think there's binderies in Orlando and in uh, Tampa that folks might use. If some of these expenses came from donations money, not state or government, do we still count it? Yes, you, you report the donations in the ASR, so you would still count it, yes. And don't, I wouldn't get necessarily too wrapped up in the details. We want sort of broad percentages and they're in different categories. You've got services, um, you've got capital outlay, you've got rent and utilities, that kind of thing. So it's your, your when, you, when you remember filling out your annual statistical report, um, you remember that there's, you, you have income that is from state, federal, local, donations and then you've got expenditures in buckets like um, collections uh, rent um, capital outlay that kind of thing so um, and we're going to assume that your salaries are probably local as well I don't know that there's a question specific on salaries but we don't think you're sp spending salary money necessarily on out-of-staters um, so But again, it, this is this is percentages. It's an estimate. Um, don't worry. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think again that the important thing is to be consistent. You know, s sort of as you're thinking about collecting this information or reporting this information, I guess is a better way of putting it. Um, think about and record how you are. Uh, uh, making this determination so that in the future you know it's easy for you to go back to how that um, 
how you did that. Now, it doesn't mean you can't tweak it. Obviously, you can. But uh, I think, you know, keeping track of how you came up with a percentage uh, may be helpful to you in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, so thinking about normal expenditures, I'm going to guess that a lot of the expenditures for circulating materials, if you're buying them from Amazon, Baker and Taylor, that, that kind of thing, probably out of state. So you would not necessarily have much money on the in-state for Maybe if you buy a lot of your Florida book awards locally, that kind of thing, but it's probably not much. If you're doing what I do as the Florida Electronic Library Coordinator and we're buying it from a national vendor, that's not in state either. We're spending a lot of money for folks who live in Michigan, unfortunately, but it's true. But on the other hand, when you're looking at your local performers, your local um, utility companies, your telecommunications charges, um, you may be you may be looking at at a lot of uh, higher levels of percentages for the for the in-state versus the out-of-state you know your rent your construction that kind of thing okay any other questions comments suggestions um my Email was on a, a beginning slide here. Um, I would like to hear from you if you've got ideas, suggestions, things that you would like to see changed, added um, to the supplemental survey to the next year's ASR. I, I'm going to be interested in getting your feedback as well when you take a look at it, when we open it up. Um, and if you, there's any volunteers you'd like to look at it beforehand, shoot me an email. I can send you our draft language. And, and you can rip it apart. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your time. And yes, do reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns. We're, we're here to help uh, and we'll do the best we can to interpret as well. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten some interesting, tricky questions. If we have this sort of program that also does this other thing and we do curbside service at the same time for the thing, how do we count that? And I'm just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Very carefully. <laughs> I got to say, the questions that I'm getting in show me how innovative and forward thinking and ready to flip and do things on a on a dime just so many creative thinking innovative folks out in our libraries every question i get in makes me value you guys even more absolutely Nope. Don't know what I've just done. I've just turned this off accidentally. Okay. Okay, I think. I think we're about there. Casey, you want to take it from here? Sure thing. Um, just a reminder, we were recording today's session. And so um, whenever Dolly or Claudia sends out a follow-up email, there will be a copy of today's video attached with that. Um, otherwise, everyone have a good Wednesday and a good rest of your week.